Welcome, Nathan. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview today. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. As always, we'd like to start by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands that we're on, as well as our ancestors, those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We also like to acknowledge our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we continue to stand on as we build and work together for our collective liberation. So I just want to start off by having you introduce yourself to our viewers and listeners. Sure. Um, so my name is Nathan Gardner, uh, and I am the executive director uh, of the Backdoor Mission uh, based out of Oshawa, uh, which also operates the Mission United Hub, of course, based in Simcoe Street United Church in the lovely downtown Oshawa. That's great. Can you share with us what the mission and vision is for Backdoor Mission? Sure. So um, we are, as the name says, for the relief of poverty, and um, it is a a uh, 30 year old organization, or sorry, a 25 year old organization uh, founded in the late 90s um, by the Reverend David Moore, uh, originally to provide respite support to those experiencing poverty and or homelessness in downtown Oshawa. Of course, since COVID, <laughs> we've gone through the massive mission, vision, et cetera, redos <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, and now we uh, help facilitate an integrated care hub, uh, which pro provides uh, primary care support of health and social services to uh, those experiencing chronic homelessness uh, and or mental health and addictions in the downtown Oshawa area. That's great work. I've been in downtown Oshawa and I've definitely seen the increased number of people who mm -hmm. in need, are in need of that support. So that's really remarkable. Uh, can you tell us about the origin of your work and how you're disrupting the multiple ecosystems across Canada with this work? Ooh, how am I disrupting ecosystems? So, I mean, I, as I said, the origin of the mission uh, was really COVID. Um, so, and it's interesting because our organization had a 10 year strategy plan and I think $50,000 budget and one employee in March of 2020. And uh, that plan was realized uh, about 90% of it within nine months time because COVID really ramped up the absolute need. And so what I really want to emphasize is that um, we had a vision of a, a hub of service that executed and utilized um, a one-stop shop and a place for an individual experiencing um, homelessness to be able to uh, access those services in a very low barrier uh, approach. And so um, that meant that they didn't have to re rely on appointments. They could expect a certain type of uh, trust and relationship and rapport building with service providers. Uh, they they looked at things uh, like policy within an organization as fluid uh, in order to meet the needs of somebody in that moment and relied on what's called a point in time model. So as much as could be provided to one person and one in that day while they're able to, um, we try to model services based on that. So if you think of the old model, um, an individual um, that might need support, say, for um, uh, housing, their ID, they might need ID, they might need to get their income um, through either Ontario Works or DSP settled, uh, and then they would have to take care of their, uh, their primary care needs, whether they be addictions-based or whether it just be they need medicine or uh, a care plan. Uh, those things in the past, you'd have to go to multiple different organizations, make appointments, call intakes, go through the process a million times. Well, the point of the mission in the hub uh, is to be able to uh, simplify. So if somebody comes in and say, I need support, and in one day, uh, probably less, they're able to get all those things checked off, at least from uh, the base level, and they're able to continue on with their, uh, their, their lives and their day. Uh, and what we do is stabilize those individuals. So um, you know, if you think of the, the key components of recovery and care and wellness, uh, you, you, it's things like you have to have enough sleep, you have to have the right type of medicine, you have to be able to be fed, the basic needs have to be met for an individual before they can meet on. So our disruption, if you would say, is to try to provide those things uh, in, a, in a system that didn't meet the needs of individuals who might not be able to uh, perform those, those functions over the course of weeks and months and and, and appointments and transit and all that sort of thing is to try to provide those things in the moment across different sectors uh, and across different organizations. That's great. I, de I definitely see how, um, you know, there is a, a trickling effect in other communities. So uh, great mm -hmm. to hear about that. How important do you think philanthropic innovation is in the work that you're doing? Oh, man. <laughs> um it's necessary. So <laughs> I think it's probably of 
if you, on a scale of one to 10, what's the most important? It's probably one through nine. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because I've, I've, oh, in ways, I know that the United States model is sometimes jealous of us because we have a lot of public investment into programs and services, social services and healthcare. But uh, on the inverse, sometimes we look at them and the philanthropic culture in, in you know, major cities, Washington and Seattle and New York and in the States, you know, I've heard of things like building food deserts or building grocery stores and food deserts, building light rail systems all through nonprofit and philanthropic uh, endeavors. And here in Canada and Ontario, we have a great philanthropic culture. It's just not the same. So um, what I what I think is um, in terms of what I think is needed next with with philanthropy, uh, I should say, first of all, imagine Canada is doing some great work on this kind of stuff. But one, as uh, as organizations, we need to work in, inwardly and begin to be get a, a lot louder, a lot more vocal about what our needs are. Um, and and not kind of play nice Canadians all the time. We sort of have to look at this and be proud, be be brazen, be bold, um, be uh, you know maybe flashy if need be, but be out there uh, about the work that we do and why we require investment, not funding investment. And so, uh, on the inverse, I think uh, uh, from a philanthropic sector. We really need to begin to understand that culture of investment in an organization. So a place like ours, I would say, we've created something new based on need out of COVID. And, and I'm not pointing just at us. There are great hub center models and, and integrated care models across the province and across the country. But they're very new and they're very organic and they require a lot of investment research. Um, they a, a lot of models based on um, you know trial and error that might be. We're trying new things. And so... Uh, in, you know, charities, philanthropy, the philanthropic sector, I believe, really has to understand that an investment in a place like ours uh, needs to be very open. Uh, it needs to be an open dialogue. It can't just be, here's however many tens of thousand dollars and make sure you serve this many people meals. Um, we really need to look together about what are the questions we're trying to answer. Because, you know, if, if homelessness and, and addictions uh, were easily solvable, then somebody would have stepped up and done it already. And so we need places that are willing to be innovative and we really need investors who are willing to buy into um, what's required for investment, the way that you would a pharmaceutical or a tech company. You know, they need time and space. Uh, they need resources. They need um, a lot of ingenuity and a lot of talent. We need those things too, but we don't have the same revenue streams. I mean, we can get into social investing and social enterprise as well, but our sector doesn't have the same revenue streams as those industries. So we need uh, the philanthropic sector to really buy into that, that mode of investment. So very true. Thank you for sharing that. What inspires you most about your current model at the Black Door Vision right now? Um, I think so. Our model is really formed around collaboration and it's about different Organ, organizations and agencies buying into one model of service, I will say very challenging, right? So we have 11 different agencies on site across, I think, three different sectors. Uh, and that includes multiple types of legislation, multiple types of unions, multiple types of policies within organizations. Some are governments, some are NGOs, some are otherwise. Um, and so trying to have all those groups work towards one goal, it's nice in a meeting room, whether it's virtual or boardroom, to talk about what our, our, our goals should be as a sector, but to actually put it into place every day on the ground uh, with, I would say, expectations is really challenging. But man, you know, sometimes, and, and, and <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky and unlucky in some ways that I, I am somewhat removed in an executive position. I'm not on the ground every day. I'm you know, usually doing relations type work. Um, but, you know, when you get the chance to go downstairs where the hub is centered and really see the results each day, and sometimes it's just a stand for 10 minutes and see, this is really amazing that an individual can come in for a meal like they would in any other church across any other country or space. And then be able to be connected in a warm handoff way to needs around human trafficking, income, ID, uh, primary care, addiction support. They can go sleep and get crisis intervention uh, and, and really get connected to legal support all within like minutes. And, and having people be able to do that in a really coordinated fashion, it's it. what motivates me is to see the efficacy and the effectiveness on a daily basis. Um, uh, and because I worked in the sector before and we tried to solve these things 
in different ways um, through systems planning. But but really, it was it. I, I've seen much more faster success that's focused on the client. And you know the the real barrier, which you might ask me later, but. The, the tough part about this is 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 really housing, right? There's not availability, and so we see a lot of our people success and progress and do so well under stabilization uh, and and really provided all the services that they need, and then only get stuck on, well, there's no housing available. I really just think if um, if we looked at all things in a pragmatic success based model, like we do here. Uh, you can really solve a lot of problems and we kind of have a, a motto is like call it a pilot right like just look at something and say well don't do it for everybody do it for a group pilot it do it over time assess it and see how it goes and i think if we took that approach um across all sectors we'd solve a lot of these issues and get a lot of success so what motivates me is just seeing how well that model works and it works because the people that are working on the ground believe in it. Like they have the opportunity and the space to make effective change for individuals. And we've given them that. So, you know, uh, we gave them that in COVID. And now my job and my role is to try to maintain it and secure it through kind of the old world, <laughs> which is a little bit more dice here. But it's what motivates me to keep going is the success. I love that. That's remarkable. What kind of challenges or barriers do you face in your work and how are you and your team working to overcome them? Well, money of what I just said is that we all have different um, individual barriers and organizations that are brought every day here. Um, but I, I think we overcome that by continually communicating with our partners and with each other. And really, I would say looking inward. So we, we kind of have a model of, like I said, um, uh, trial and assess. And so if it's small as something as we're going to change a program from one room to another or something from outside to inside, it's let's do it with a small amount of people and assess it every two weeks, look at the gaps, look at the safety, look at the risk, all that sort of stuff, look at the success about it. Um, and so, you know, that that's a way of, of uh, in, internally on the ground kind of uh, assessing those challenges each day. The bigger one is really on a systems and community level. So. I mean, I, I will start by saying we have so much support from so many entities of the community, both uh, business sector, neighborhood sector, uh, governments, et cetera. But I mean, the challenge of, you know, whether it's NIMBYism, whether it's um, a, a lack of understanding of uh, addictions and homelessness, uh, it really is tough to make headway in the efficient manner that we want to, when we have to keep coming back and fighting these challenges. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that's always tough is, is trying to answer those questions about the nature of our work and the nature of our people uh, on, a, on an ongoing iterative basis, over and over again, at community meetings, town halls, phone calls, interviews, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, because, you know, we get the, we get the same questions as I've been here for two and a half years, and it's, are the people coming from Oshawa? Are they coming from outside? How many of your people actually are attracted here? Um, are they um, trying to get jobs? Are they um, actually trying to take part in your programs? Um, why are they Why are they in that situation? Like, tell me what the reason is, and let's go attack it. Is it the police? Is it the Is it a, a problem with um, the government? Is it housing? Like, let's 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 find it. But the challenge is really trying to communicate that this is a one. It's a it's a it's a world problem that's existed forever <laughs> um, and it's just really exacerbated right now. And two, the, the, the challenges and the success are not like take a pill and it's over. They are very, very community based and, and, and usually involve everybody's support and take a long time. So trying to have those conversations is, is a challenge. Um, but uh, you know, that's something that we, we kind of welcome here. It's just a matter of, time and resources. And then without getting into too many details, of course, the biggest challenge is money. <laughs> we have the funding, the resources to be able to do it, to make sure that our people are not um, burnt out too quickly, that they're able to support our our, uh, our our individuals and and that our staff is kind of, you know, easily retained and, and well themselves. So I think our sector as a whole, which you guys would know, um, suffers from a lot of that stuff. And in, in you know, on the ground, community-based mental health addictions and homelessness service, it's probably, I'm not going to go out and say it's its where it's the worst, but it, I'm hazard to guess it might be kind of the toughest part of the sector. 
so very true. Uh, do you have a key set of priorities that you're working on right now uh, beyond like your general mandate that you'd like to highlight? Do you mean me individually or as a, as a team or? I uh, know the Blue Door mission, if they have anything specific um, to highlight right now. Um, well, the biggest thing is our addictions continuum. So, um, you know, our, sorry, our treatment continuum that focuses on addiction. So, so the treatment world has been around, of course, for a long time, but like anything else, it, that it doesn't really allow um, for the the part of the population that suffers from chronic homelessness and concurrent disorders. So we've created a, a pilot a couple of years ago that focused on uh, removing the gaps and barriers and uh, to, to the, the the normal residential treatment process, which includes detox stay and then a wait for a treatment bed and then being transitioned into a living scenario. So that's okay if you have a family and support and a house, but when you are homeless and you don't have teed up, um, you know, uh, where you're going to go after something like this. One, the reality is you probably need longer. Uh, most of our people and most people within, you know, addictions and homelessness, they need, they need a lot of cracks out of, they need a lot of support. So we are advocating for a, uh, what's called a continuum, which includes elements of free treatment readiness, uh, stabilization, withdrawal management, um, a detox, a residential treatment stay that's transitioned into post-treatment, uh, which includes more of acclimatization and, and, and living-based scenarios and getting ready to be back into the, uh, the uh, I shouldn't say back into the world, but and enter a world uh, that's all focused on a client-centered approach, harm reduction methods, everything else that might be ent entitled, and really having a team that wraps around that individual that supports them from beginning to end, all with a focus on uh, principles that are based on we don't discharge people, go back into homelessness, and we prepare them, it's all towards making sure that they are housed at the end and stable at the end of that. So that's something that it's a new initiative within the mission. Um, there's lots of programs and places that provide pockets of all those things I mentioned, detox, treatment, post-treatment. Um, our idea is to bring them together, make sure gaps are alleviated, make sure there's communication throughout. And we're really hoping um, we have a few uh, proposals, whether they're funding uh, or partnership based, uh, that really, we hope, can uh, accelerate this program. We were lucky enough to receive funding from the Ontario Trillium Foundation uh, this past year to really get it uh, re, uh, regenerated. Um, but that's something that is a, uh, if it's if it's as, as successful as the pilot was, which basically stabilized and housed, I think it was 85% of the participants in year one, which is, if you know anything about the treatment world, a pretty remarkable number. Um, you know, we're we're hopeful that it can uh, expand and be a model that uh, that can really utilize and help a lot of people. That's great. How do you feel about the future of impact investing and social finance in Canada? Um, you know what's funny? So I sat with a fellow at a uh, recent an entire nonprofit network did a uh, a really good symposium around um, um, social everything, enterprise investment. Uh, financing at all. And uh, they said that the really, they have a lot of young uh, people who are social minded and investment ready, who would like to be basically cause investors. And the biggest drawback right now is um, trying to uh, trying to get boards, so nonprofit boards around the idea of accepting the risk of social investing. And so to me, I think that's really um, uh, I think that can be really uh, seen as a positive and optimistic because if you think those two, that's a generational gap, right? Most of those people who are young social cause investors are Gen Z or millennials. And most people who probably sit on the board are, I mean, <laughs> are, are, are typical, either they're boomers or they're Xers. And, um, you know, probably as we know, it's improving, but not as BIPOC as we'd like it to be to represent our community. Um, and so those things kind of tend to change over time. And I'm I'm pretty hopeful that as that composition changes within boards, uh, and they become more of those uh, those you know Xers and or sorry those millennials and Zers um, that are growing up uh, with that social mindset, um, that the future is going to look bright and it's going to be a literacy thing. So people are going to be prepared for risk. They're going to be all in on social causes and social investment. Um, right now in the immediate, there's a lot of learning and a lot of trying to get people to understand and get over the hump, which I understand. But in terms of the future, like I just, I think it's something that as our generations take over, um, I'm really enthused by the amount that um, 
you know, our younger generations are, are, are taking on this sort of thing. Yeah, like you said, it, it, it's changing, not at the rate we would like, but it is changing. So we at least yeah. applaud that. Um, so let us know, paint the picture, what is your ultimate goal with the Backdoor Mission? And what would the ultimate success look like for you and your colleagues? Well, it's interesting because I don't, I don't think it's quite, I don't feel so comfortable saying what's my ultimate goal because the whole mission is based on an idea of collaboration. So everybody here, I mean, as any organization would say, your goal to focus towards one goal, but um, everybody here has unique visions of where we can go. Um, but our vision really, as I've tried to hit home as much as possible, is based on ecosystem and community. So my vision is a place that is not just right now, we are service-based. Our people come here and they receive probably the best, <laughs> I would say, uh, level of care and services um, that I've seen anyway. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are community ingrained. So what I see is a space and a place that is um, embraced and a part of a vibrant community where it's not just people who are homeless and, and, and suffering from addictions are coming to this physical space, but we are part of a community that embraces. And so physically, we would have uh, things that, you know, you might see at community centers or in public spaces, which is very um, representation of art and culture and uh, vibrancy and commerce. Um, and so a space that's almost like market-based, but also has those support for individuals, more integrated within the uh, the community, rather than this is where we need to send people and where you go if you are suffering and if you're of this demographic, but a place where you can go as a part of the Oshawa downtown community or the Oshawa community at all, at all um, as, as a really kind of exciting, vibrant place that also is supportive. Absolutely. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action that you'd like to share with the community? Um, oh, man, I, I think it's get out and learn physically. Like to me, it's interesting because the most success we've had uh, with with either changing people's minds or educating people or, you know, getting politicians to buy in or getting donors to buy in and give us money. It's been when we've brought them here and shown us the shown them the physical space and what we do. So you can't understand a place like the mission until you actually go and immerse yourself and see what's there every day. And one of the things that I believe COVID has really um, taken away from us is our ability um, to to really uh, uh, jump in and be a part of community spaces, public spaces that that uh, provide community inclusion, neighborhoods. And so uh, my call to action to anybody is sitting and wondering if you own a business or you're part of a community, uh, you know, uh, what can I do? How can I be a part of it? What's going on? You know, to me, it's 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 great to go online and learn and read articles and 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 view media interviews like that's a part of it. But jump in and and learn about a space by going to it. And Mission is one of those great examples. You know, we used to run a leadership program through Durham. And one of the learning days was just highlighting unique spaces. And we took a bus and drove participants around um, to all these different spaces. And they were based on, you know, environmental ingenuity, business ingenuity, things that are just different and new. And it was the most popular day and people learn the most because um, you don't really get a sense of what a space is or what they do until you're physically a part of it. And so my call to action besides, hey, visit back to our mission, um, visit our website and, and provide us money and see us on social media. Um, it's to come to spaces like ours and actually take part in them, come to events, learn about those places by being there. Get out in the community and experience it firsthand. I love that. That's a great yeah, And way. that goes, sorry, that goes to like, not just if you're a community member, but like we were able, as I said, we were able to change minds. And I know we're not the only ones with, with, with ministers and politicians in the province and in the region, because they came here and said, this is the place that we need to invest in and need to support. So like, that's, that's everywhere. That's if it doesn't matter if you're leader of our country or just a, you know, high school kid. <laughs> go to places. <laughs> Absolutely. Get out there for sure. Thank you for that. Um, I really champion the work that you're doing uh, here in Oshawa. It's very valuable. I uh, would love to see that, you know, trickle into other communities. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. And we really champion and applaud the work that you're doing in the community. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for asking me. And uh, if, uh, if you want a tour, blessed, just 
give me a shout and <laughs> you're not too far away. Uh, yeah, I may just take you up on that. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so we just want to close off the way we began uh, by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands that we're on, as well as our ancestors and those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We want to acknowledge our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we continue to stand on as we share, learn, and work together for a collective liberation and sovereignty. So once again, thank you so much, Nathan, and thank you to our viewers and listeners. Thank you, Blessed.